All right, and get going. So this morning's call to worship is a familiar passage. It's been the passage that we've been looking at for the last six or seven weeks is our key passage. But rather than read it again this morning, I just want to kind of personalize it a little bit and ask you the questions, the five questions that Paul is asking in Philippians 2, 1 through 5, and then give you some of the advice that he gives when you answer those in, in the affirmative. So here are the questions I want you to think about this morning. Number one, are you encouraged at all by your connection to Christ? Are you encouraged by that? Number two, do you get any comfort that Jesus loves you? That should be easy. <laughs> Number three, do you maintain a fellowship with the Spirit of God? Number four, do you have any tenderness? Number five, do you have any compassion? Now, if you answered in the affirmative on those things, Paul has some advice. He says, if you think about those things and practice those things, do it in a very single-minded way. Focus on it. And that will bring joy to you and joy to God. And as you do that, remember this. Don't do it in a selfish, self-centered way. And by all means, don't be arrogant or conceited. But instead, take a look around the room at the people that are here with us in this weird little way. And look at them the same way God looks at them. He gives us all tremendous value. So value and esteem each other. And as you go out into the world and you meet your own needs, Remember to meet the needs of others as well. And when you do that, you're taking on the very mind, the very spirit, and the very mission of Christ. All right? Let's worship together this morning. We're going to sing together now. Uh, this next hymn uh, comes from the Blue Hymnal. Number 46, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Uh, and this is going to be a recording from February 1st, 2015. Mm -hmm. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas
Gina's going to lead our children's story next. Hi, guys. Let's see. Let's uh, share my screen here, and I will show you guys. Oh, Brandon, um, it says that the host has per disabled participant screen sharing. Try again. It should be better okay. now. No problem. Excellent. Now it's working. Okay. Oh, no. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, we have a story this morning about Honor, Honor's new home. On This is Honor. She's a pony, and she used to live in a field much like this, where there wasn't very much grass to eat. It's brown, mostly. And one day, a boy and some grown-ups came to see her. He gave her something to nibble on there. And Honor liked the new people, especially the boy. He seemed nice, yeah. And they took Honor to a new home with a new field of grass. Very nice. A new place to go inside when it rains or to sleep, cozy place. And she has these new neighbors. Mm-hmm. They're kind of standoffish, but they're still good neighbors. And sometimes Kitty stop by and visit her. Nice soft kitties like that. Yeah, the, even a couple of chickens next door and everybody knows that chickens are fun to look at. Yes, they're very interesting. And she has lots of green grass to eat and a nice tree to stand under if the sun gets too hot. And she has a big bin full of food that's all for her, just for her. And a little boy and his brother sometimes ride her. Yeah. Honor likes them a lot. They're very nice. Yeah, very nice. And there's a nice lady who pets her and gives her grain to eat, which is very nice. It's worth being caught for even. Honor loves her new home. Yeah, she loves it very much. Honor made a big change to a new home. It could have been scary or sad, even a bad place, but it wasn't. Sometimes changes can be great, especially if, remember, if we remember that God is with us always, okay, always. No matter what kind of change it is, God is with us and helping us. If it's a good change with people we love or even a bad change. Yeah, let's pray. Thank you, God, for being with us always, for taking care of us. And we know that you're with you. You're with us no matter what kind of change it is mm -hmm. and that you'll take care of us so it will always be a good change for us we pray in jesus name amen bye-bye bye-bye thanks gina good morning everyone Welcome to Zion Mennonite Church and our service this morning. As you can see, uh, I'm in the sanctuary, and I want you to know that the sanctuary misses you. So we look forward to sometime being back in this place. So I thought it would be good to be here this morning. Uh, my name's Bill. I serve as one of the pastors here at Zion, and it is good to be with you. If you're visiting with us this morning from, well, you could be from anywhere. Who knows where you're coming to us from today? But welcome to those that are visitors and to those that are normally part of our service. It's good to have you here this morning. I want to introduce to us Terry Redeker. Terry is serving as our uh, district minister, part of the conference here, district pastor. So uh, Terry currently is uh, half time uh, working at the Western Mennonite Church in Salem as their interim pastor. So Terry and I have that in common, both of us sharing interim work. And uh, you're gonna see Terry, uh, he's watching us this morning, but I wanna give Terry just a few minutes to share with us anything he would like to share with us and a chance for you to uh, get to meet Terry. So Terry, uh, take a few moments and uh, share with us, please. As uh, Bill mentioned, I am Terry Rediger. 
and uh, presently a half-time interim pastor at uh, Western Mennonite Church in Salem, Oregon. Uh, my wife and I actually live in Dallas, Oregon, and uh, I've been assigned, as Bill mentioned, as the role of district pastor for Zion Mennonite Church, and I would like to bring you greetings from Pacific Northwest Mennonite Conference and from uh, our conference minister, Catherine Jamison Pitts. Uh, just a few things about me. I was born and grew up in Miller, South Dakota. I grew up on a farm in a Mennonite family with four brothers and one sister. I, after high school, I moved out to Salem, Oregon and attended Chemeketa Community College studying accounting. I was there for two years. And then after that, I went into uh, Mennonite Voluntary Service for two years, and I served in La Junta, Colorado, uh, in BS. And after uh, voluntary service, then I went to Goshen College and completed my bachelor's degree. And then I, my bachelor's degree was in Bible. And I followed that up by attending Associate Mennonite Biblical Seminaries in Elkhart, Indiana and got my degree in pastoral ministries from there. My wife, Geraldine and I have been married for almost 40 years, and we have two married children and three grandchildren. I've served as pastor in Mennonite churches in East Peoria, Illinois, in Waterloo, Iowa, in Ritzville, Washington, which is uh, when I first got to know Pacific Northwest Mennonite Conference. And then after that, I served in Turpin, Oklahoma. And now I am serving in at Western Mennonite Church in Salem, Oregon. I look forward to getting better acquainted with the people of Zion Mennonite Church. And I'm available to offer support and care for your pastors and for your congregation. It's good to be with you today. Thank you for allowing me to join you on this Sunday. I guess that's all I have, Bill. All right, thank you, Terry, appreciate it. Good to, good to meet you. Uh, Terry and I have not met face to face yet uh, because I just started uh, when we went uh, into this uh, kind of this lockdown mode uh, and so uh, but we've been meeting each other on zoom and some phone conversations so Terry thanks for being with us this morning Frank now will read the scripture for us okay Philippians 3 1 through 16 finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh. It is we who are the circumcision. It is we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I, Paul, myself have reasons for such confidence. If anybody else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews, and in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal for the church, I persecuted the church. And as for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. But, <laughs> but, Whatever I thought was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing glory of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I now consider them rubbish, garbage, trash, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness that comes from God comes by faith. I want to know Christ 
I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining resurrection to eternal life. Now that I have all, not, not that I have already obtained all of this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to, but this one thing I do, I forget what is behind and I yearn or reach out for or strain towards that which is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God called me heavenward towards in Christ Jesus. Everyone who is mature should take that view of things. And if on some point you think differently, well, then God will make that clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Bill, that's good material, so knock it out of the park. Thanks, Frank. Appreciate that. If you were with us last Sunday, uh, you'll recall that we had some technical um, issues, problems, challenges. Uh, if that happens again this week, perhaps uh, the video is lagging or you can't hear me well, uh, Brandon has the power uh, to turn the video off so you can hear me. Um, so as you listen or watch, whatever the case may be, again, we're thankful for this technology. We recognize some of the challenges it brings with us. But again, that's just a reminder of our desire to be together face to face. This weekend uh, is Memorial Day weekend, and tomorrow is Memorial Day. What does a Mennonite pastor do with Memorial Day? Memorial Day is a day set aside by our country to recognize and honor those that are in military service or have served or who have died in service. And being a Mennonite, uh, not in favor of war in any way, maybe it'd be easier just to just not mention it, just let it pass by. Um, but I feel that I can say that I appreciate those folks who have served in the military. Perhaps you know of people who have, uh, maybe you have family that have served, maybe you have served. And I want you to know that I can appreciate those that have served our country that way. I also recognize the loss that families have encountered um, for those that have died. And that is those that have died in military service, but anyone who has experienced that loss, death of a close loved one of a family member. We have several families in this congregation who are experiencing that loss right now. And there's a call on us as believers to mourn with those who mourn. And so this morning I recognize that, and, and we do, we, we mourn with those who mourn and grief Grief is a process, and sometimes grief can feel very lonely. And I want you to know that this call to mourn with those who mourn means that you don't need to grieve alone. And I hope you have people, if you are grieving, that are close to you and know that we as a congregation desire to reach out to you. And you, whether it's uh, contacting me or Jan or someone else in the congregation, but don't feel like you have to go through grief alone. The Bible also says that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice. And we are in a study, the book of Philippians right now, focusing in on a joy perspective. You might wonder, how is it that we can say that we mourn and also say that we rejoice? What is it about joy that we can maintain joy even in the midst of grief and loss, even in the midst of missing things that we wish we could do that currently we cannot do? Well, that's what we've been diving into as we look in the book of Philippians, trying to understand more and more this joy that Paul talks about and rejoicing no matter what. And so that joy is much deeper 
part of who we are, our identity in Christ. We are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and that newness, that identity with Christ is the depth of joy that we can have even in the midst of despair, of loss. And that's why in Philippians 3, Paul states here, and he says, finally, and really he didn't mean finally because we're only halfway through the book of Philippians. You know, speakers do that sometimes, don't they? They'll say in conclusion and talk for 30 more minutes. Um, maybe even I have done that already. So I could get that out of the way up front here and say finally, and then get to the points. But Paul's making a connection here in regards to this continuing theme in the book of Philippians about joy. This joy perspective we've been talking about in Philippians, and I don't know if you've picked up on it, but each sermon uh, theme has a P in it somewhere. The first Sunday we looked at this was April 19th, and we looked at prayer, a perspective of prayer. On the 26th, the next week, we looked at problems. Last week, we looked at purpose. And now we're going to look at, uh, last week, we looked at position. It was purpose and then process last week, and this week we're looking at position. See how P's can get a little confusing if we put them too close together? But I did that just as a way to help me remember and try and reflect on this joy perspective. So we're looking at our position, a joy perspective on our position, or even to think about God's perspective on our position. I could have entitled this perhaps the question Having the right name, what does that mean? Sometimes uh, when you are new to a Mennonite group, like I'm fairly new to this group at Zion, we play the Mennonite game. And the Mennonite game consists of, well, what is, you know, your name and your last name? And we can go into all kinds of names. And names are important. If we were to play the Mennonite game, uh, my names that I would bring to the table would be my last name, blank, B-L-A-N-K, not a lot of blanks in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm working on that. Uh, other names that I would bring to the table would be Nolt, Lap, Martin, Oberholzer, Fisher, Weaver, Smoker, and Byler. Those are all names that are in my family diagram. So, did I make the cut? Am I in? Do I have the right name? Paul's saying in this uh, letter, in Philippians chapter 3 particularly, he's saying all this stuff of who we are, although it might uh, matter, it's not the most important thing. One commentator says, using his own background as an example, Paul reminded the believers at Philippi, of the centrality and supremacy of Christ. A right relationship with God is possible, not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what Christ has done. We are saved by grace through faith. We live the Christian life by grace through faith. This living and doing and being, Paul's really pulling us into an understanding of how Christ needs to be at the center of that. This chapter, chapter 3 in Philippians, gives us a perspective on what is of true value in this life and on into eternity. Paul teaches us that all the profit, gain, wealth of this world can't begin to compare the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Now, I have stuff, and I like my stuff. But I have to remember that the who I am, my upbringing, the stuff I have, and I I have some stuff, but I need more, all that isn't as important as this relationship, this connection to Jesus. Certainly, we need to be generous, with our material goods, but to recognize that we have a storehouse of wealth greater than silver and gold, greater than any amount of money. 
If we want to share something of eternal and infinite value, we need to make known the riches of this relationship with Jesus. If we want to discover joy, and this discovery of joy is a joy that continues to grow in who we are, we will find it in sharing these incomparable blessings that are found in Jesus. It is the sharing out of who we are that displays this joy for all to see. To be full of joy, we are full of joy if we recognize and understand our position, our position as God looks on us is based on our faith, based on our faith and not by what we do. Although what we do is important, our joy is based upon that faith. We are made right with God not by our own efforts, but by simply relying on God's grace. God's grace given to us. If you remember, Paul starts this letter. Again, I have my packages of grace. I'm really good with these visual displays here. Grace and peace. Gifts, packages to continue to look at and unwrap as we engage in relationship with one another and as we engage in life in what God puts in front of us each and every day. How do we understand that from this perspective of our position in Christ, with Christ, that God looks upon us as understanding who we are through the faith, through the belief, through the understanding of Scripture? So verses 8 and 9 in this text this morning in Philippians chapter 3, what is more, Paul's saying, I consider everything a loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So this understanding, again, focusing on Jesus, for, the sake, for whose sake I have lost all things. And then he says this, I consider them garbage. I think that's the most friendly way to translate that word, garbage. Other translations say things like dung, um, and other words, and you can look that up if you want. Garbage, send her garbage, that I may gain Christ. And that's that position that we are with Christ. I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but that which is through faith in Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him and to know Christ. That is that position that we are with Christ. And where is Christ? Christ, it says, um, in several places, Luke twenty two sixty nine, 69, Ephesians 1, 20, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, we know by the power of God's Spirit that um, Jesus is everywhere, God is everywhere, but positionally, the importance of recognizing that God sees me through my faith in Christ, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Why is that important? I think this image of Jesus being seated is one that's helpful for me because when I am seated, I tend to be in a position of relaxing, a position of not as anxious, perhaps. So the imagery would be that Jesus isn't up in heaven running around worried about, oh no, there's a, a virus in the on the earth. What am I going to do about it? No, Jesus is seated. He's not surprised by what happens in our lives. So there is an understanding that this perspective of position is important, that Jesus is seated there. Colossians 3.1 says, since then, and this is Paul writing, since then you have been raised with Christ. Again, that's that connection, that position. We are raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above and again, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Positionally, we are there with Christ. That's what these verses are saying. And the joy that that can have then in us is to recognize that because of our position, the things that are going on in this world, they're important things. They impact us. But I can have a joy perspective knowing that my position in the eyes of God are with Christ. 
And that can bring us joy, even in the midst of all the unknowns that are happening in our world, all the things that are going on maybe in our own lives, to recognize this position. I also see here in Philippians, Paul calling us towards this understanding of God's favor. Righteousness that comes from God. This righteousness comes out of our faith and the basis of our faith. This isn't a righteousness that I can do by the things that I can perform or the relationships that I have. This is not our own righteousness. Some of you may recall in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 64, it talks about the fact that God sees human righteous acts as filthy rags. Again, that imagery of garbage, of they're not worth anything. But recognizing that I have this position with Jesus is through the righteousness and faith that I have as a believer in Christ, that God doesn't see me as being filthy, but does see me as being righteous. But it's not my works that makes me righteous. Well, then what, what do I need to do? If it's not my works that makes me righteous, can I, just, can I just stay home all the time? Well, if you don't know it, we've been forced to stay home all the time. Did it change our position with Christ? We can't do as much in these days. No, our position, our identity remains the same. Because that righteousness is not in the actions that we do, although we're called to do those things um, in this world that God calls us to. It's not that we can sit at home, but because of the righteousness that we do have, we will do things. We will do acts of ministry and service and connection and walking with one another, mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. But it's not those actions that gets me any closer to God. It has been said that there is nothing I can do to make God love me more. And there's nothing I can do to make God love me less. And you might wonder, how could I say that? Well, I know that God sent his son to die on a cross. His one and only son. That you and I might have salvation. A relationship with God. That happened long before I showed up on this planet long before any of us showed up on this planet. That's how much God loves us, even before we were born. And because of that, I know that my uh, actions don't make God love me more or less. God loves you. God loves me. God loves each one of us. And it's because of that love that you and I are given the opportunity to serve in this kingdom and on this world and to do that which God calls us to. But again, the position as God sees us is through the righteousness of Christ. And we become then part of the church, the body. In uh, Confession of Faith and a Mennonite Perspective, in the Article 11, it talks about baptism. And it's this connection with the body of Christ as believers being in the church that our position of being with Christ, our position of favor with God also places us in this body of Christ. And for those that are part of Zion Mennonite, it's part of being this congregation. So in this Article 11, baptism, it talks about um, obviously baptism, this connection with Christ it says, baptism is done in obedience to Jesus' command and as a public commitment to identify with Jesus Christ. Again, there's that connection. It goes on to say, not only in his baptism by water, but in his life in the spirit and in his death in suffering love. The baptism of blood or baptism of suffering is the offering of one's life, even to death. Jesus understood the giving of his life through the shedding of his blood for others as a baptism. He also spoke about the disciples' suffering and death as a baptism. 
Those who accept water baptism commit themselves to follow Jesus in giving their lives for others, in loving their enemies, and in renouncing violence, even when it means their own suffering or death. Suffering. Is that part of this position? Is that part of being in God's kingdom yet living in this world? If we can get clarity on our position and seeing God's perspective, helping us maintain this joy perspective, here's what I see happening, this resulting in uh, an understanding of who we are. And my names, my doesn't make me righteous. Growing up in a Mennonite home, growing up in a Mennonite church doesn't make me righteous. So that's a proper perspective, and my stuff doesn't make me righteous. That's going to help me get this perspective. It also, verse 10 in Philippians chapter 3, talks about this power. I want to know Christ, Paul says. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. I like that part. Can we just stop there? <clears throat> but it goes on to say then, now it's not only about that power of the resurrection, but it's also the participation in his suffering becoming like him in his death. I've been reading again a book by Paul E. Miller called A Loving Life. I always like to do a little show and tell Sunday mornings if you haven't thought about that I show you books. In this book, though, he talks about the cru that suffering is the crucible for love. Suffering is the frame, the context, where we learn love. I don't know if I can say that I've suffered in life. I mean, I can say that, but I haven't suffered like some have suffered. I haven't suffered to the point of thinking I was going to die. I haven't suffered, um, as we read in some of the uh, history of our church, the way some of the martyrs have suffered. Certainly not. So my suffering is pretty minimal in the perspective of life. But in those moments when it feels like we are suffering, and perhaps it's a, an injustice, perhaps it's loss of a loved one, perhaps it's not getting all in life that we thought we would get. It's in those times that love continues to grow and develop within us. For without suffering, we do not know the extent of which God's love can reach into our hearts and lives. I don't believe God causes us to suffer. I think suffering happens because of life. And in the midst of life and the suffering that does go on, although I don't believe God causes it, I believe God is with us in it. And I'm sure people watching this morning can share from their own stories about things they have walked through in life that have really felt like suffering. But God doesn't ever bail out on us in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our pain, that God is with us. And it's in those moments that we can recognize the, the joy, the perspective of joy that comes out of suffering and the love that God has for each of us. In Jesus' suffering and my identity with that suffering is this depth of learning this identity of joy through God's love. God continues to pour out his love upon us regardless of what we might face in this life, regardless of where we are or what we're doing might not always feel like God loves us. But the depth of joy goes beyond that feeling. The depth of joy connects with our hearts through a spiritual understanding of how God's Spirit is at work in each one of us, at each one of our lives. And then, finally, not the way Paul used it here, but therefore, to understand that joy continues to be bolstered 
by hope of what is ahead. And verse 14, Paul clearly is getting us on board. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We're all headed to an end, to death, more than likely. I mean, statistically, looking back at history, as a pastor, I can kind of certainly say we will die. Each one of us will face that moment of death. Now, Jesus could interrupt that at any moment, but statistically speaking, we will die. But the, the, the inspiration, the joy, hope as we have that connection of faith with Jesus. We're headed towards heaven. We know the end of the story. And it's not about skipping ahead. It is about living the life which God calls us to. And even in the midst of the, the suffering, in the midst of maybe the best, happiest times, to keep in perspective that we do have a place where we're headed to be with Christ physically, literally seated with him in heaven, that focus on headed towards that heavenly place. Verse 16 says, let us live up to what we've already attained. And that is that onward, forward, moving into what God has for us individually and even corporately as a congregation. That God, God's calling us to continue to grow in this relationship, in this understanding of joy as we look forward to the hope that is before us, the hope of righteousness through Christ and ultimately the hope of heaven, that hope of heaven that is inspiring us even today as we think about that which God calls us to, having this perspective of joy. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for this morning and for being with us in the all the places where we are at this morning. And God, we are grateful for your love for us. We're grateful for the fact that we can gather in this way. Continue to bless us. We would ask that, but also God, reveal to us how you want us to grow in our joy, grow in our perspective, grow in who we are, because we know our position uh, with you through Jesus, being led by the Spirit into that which he calls us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's respond together in song. Uh, there is more love somewhere. There is more love.
we miss you and we miss being together with you on Sunday. Um, one announcement I want to make is there is a Bible study um, on Zoom on Tuesday mornings that anyone is welcome to join that is led by Pat Hirschberger and they're studying the book of Romans. So look for an email uh, with the link that you can uh, click on to join that Bible study if you'd like to. Also, there will be a private um, burial for Maynard Knopfsiger this Tuesday at one o'clock at Zion. That is for the family members. And we will let you know uh, more details regarding Jim Graber uh, when we know those, that information. Let's go to prayer. Those being Jubilee Food Pantry, the Canby Center, and Bridging Cultures. In the midst of this pandemic, God help us with our fear and all of the unknowns. We know that you provide for our needs. Remind us to reach out to one another. Give us grace for each other. We pray for our families this morning and children that have been sheltering in place. God, would you bless the work and the play that they are doing together? We ask that you provide creative ways that they can grow and learn while they're at home. We give you praise for new life and the birth of Elijah Gerald Wimp this past week, that we could be encouragers even as we remain isolated. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Frank will send us with a benediction. Trying to get turned on here. There we go. All right, this week, be encouraged about your position in Christ and take comfort in his love. Stay in fellowship with the Spirit. Uh, be gentle and compassionate and go out and serve others and put on Christ. Amen. Please um, stay online to interact.